from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Finally back in the studio. I'm Ty Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. China's hungry for U.S. wheat, so is it changing the demand picture for grains? A look at USDA's latest reports. How to make every acre on your farm count. We're finding a, a good ballpark number of about 10% of our farms are, are in this marginal state. Returning back to the family's dairy farm after college, Ben Smith had big dreams and even bigger plans. It's kind of humbling to come back and say, hey, you, did, somebody, did somebody tell you you need to slow your roll? Uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. And at 31 years old, we'll tell you how this Virginia dairy farmer bought the family's operation, finding his own footing to prosper. And in John's world. The great lemming lie. U.S. Farm Report, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when blood, sweat, and tears meet rain, wind, and sun. Pioneer, what's next happens here. USDA issuing its final USDA crop reports of the year. The last time USDA released its monthly supply and demand reports, it made changes to yield that the market saw as bearish. Well, there wasn't much excitement in USDA's December reports. Despite weather concerns sprouting in Brazil, USDA did not make any major adjustments to the South American corn or soybean crop in those reports, only minor revisions to corn. USDA cutting its estimate for Brazil's soybean by 2 million metric tons. That now sets at 161 million metric tons. The agency left Brazil's corn production estimate at 129 million metric tons. It also made no adjustments to its estimate for corn or soybeans in Argentina. Mexico and China's recent ramped up buys of U.S. corn and wheat did prompt USDA to cut its U.S. corn ending stocks estimate by 25 million bushels in the December report. Corn ending stocks in the U.S., according to USDA's estimates, now set at 2.13 billion bushels. The agency also cutting wheat ending stocks by 25 million bushels, USDA leaving soybean ending stocks unchanged in the U.S. We'll have more analysis from the recent reports coming up in our marketing roundtables. Well, this caused the wheat market to rally this week. China making some big buys of U.S. ag, and we're not just talking about corn and soybeans. The country buying more than 1 million metric tons, or about 37.1 million bushels, of soft red winter wheat this week. Monday's buy of 440,000 metric tons was China's largest daily purchase of U.S. wheat ever. Experts say China is importing wheat after heavy rain hit key growing areas just ahead of harvest and reduced the quality of their crop. And market analysts tell us they expect more U.S. business soon with Ukraine wheat exports down and global production issues. Meanwhile, cattle moving in the opposite direction. After hitting record highs in September, live cattle futures made new lows this week, and many of the feeder cattle future contracts hit new contract lows. February live cattle futures correcting $30 from the contract high set on September 19th, while January feeders broke nearly $60 from their high. That was set on September 15th. Brad Kuma tells us fundamentals have not changed radically. One thing that is different is our average weights are higher. Um, right. And, uh, you know, partly because of that, we've lost something that is critical to your ability to to uh, have any kind of power in the marketplace. And that word is leverage. Um, we had it for a long time uh, because we've done such a great job of being current. He says increased numbers in the last two cattle on feed reports and some economic uncertainty caused the funds, which were near to record long in the cattle markets, to liquidate to nearly flat position. The last part of the sell-off in feeder futures may have also been tied to margin calls on short feeder puts tied to the LRP program. And more pork producers are losing their contracts. Smithfield Foods announcing it will end contracts with 26 hog farms in Utah. A statement from the world's largest pork processor cited an industry oversupply of pork, weaker consumer demand, and high feed price as challenges. It's estimated the number of Smithfield jobs impacted may be up to one-third of the 210 currently employed at Smithfield's Utah hog production operations. The company announcing in October it would be closing a pork processing plant in Charlotte, North Carolina. And earlier this year, you'll remember we reported that Smithfield was closing 35 sow farms in Putnam and Mercer counties in northern Missouri. It just confirms economists' fears that we're going to see more consolidation in the pork industry. 
For the second month in a row, farmers are more optimistic about the ag economy. That's according to the latest ag economy barometer by Purdue University and the CME Group. The November survey of farmers says that the index climbed five points to 115. That's 12 points higher than a year ago as U.S. farmers report an improved perception of their farm's financial condition and future prospects. Helping push the index higher was the impression of current conditions of 12 points over last month. Farm financial performance index this month was up three points compared to October and up four points compared to a year ago, but that still leaves that index 11 points lower than it was two years ago. When we asked farmers what their biggest concerns were for the upcoming year, they still point to high input costs as a top concern, but rising interest rates and lower crop and livestock prices are also increasingly sources of concern for farmers. More farmers, or 16% of those surveyed, say now is a good time to make large capital investments. That pushed the capital investment index to 42 points. One reason, more farmers say there is now higher dealer inventory. Minturk says that may be an indication that farm equipment price increases are starting to moderate. Well, the chair of the House Ag Committee, Glenn G.T. Thompson, says he's been diagnosed with prostate cancer. Thompson, a Republican from Pennsylvania, releasing this statement on social media. He says he was diagnosed following a routine physical and testing. The 64-year-old says he plans to continue representing the people of his district while tackling this head-on. So far, it appears he's still running for re-election in 2024, adding that he appreciates prayers and privacy at this time. Thompson is currently stewarding work on a new farm bill. That's up for the news, a warm up and a cool down with more moisture on the way. We'll have a check of your weather next. And this won't take you but a minute to do. Sign up for the Case IH holiday giveaway. Each lucky winner will get a Case IH prize pack full of great gifts. We'll announce the winners just before Christmas each day on Ag Day. Then the grand prize winner will be announced just before the holiday right here on U.S. Farm Report. And they'll win a special Farm All C pedal tractor just in time for Christmas. Stand your head to the website on your screen, caseihholidaygiveaway.com. U.S. Farm Report weather is brought to you by H&S Manufacturing. Take advantage of our special 3.9% low-rate retail finance program. Get 3.9% financing for 48 months on qualifying H&S equipment through the end of 2023. See your local dealer for more info. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht joins us now with weather. Matt, a warm up this week followed by a cool down, but that active weather pattern seems to be pumping out more moisture across the country. Oh, the best way to phrase this uh, regarding uh, the impacts uh, from rain or snow, short lived and, and you'll see why. So look at the jet stream, how it's going to evolve Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. While this is a deep trough and it is going to pick up a lot of moisture from the Gulf of Mexico and send it along the East Coast. No, we're not going to see a pocket of cold air, an Arctic blast settle in and across the United States. Uh, the reason for that uh, kind of twofold. One is that the jet stream is going to keep moving west to east, which is going to usher that cold air back up to the north and east. Even with a secondary shot of some colder air trying to dig down to the south, a ridge of high pressure down here in the south is going to keep everything bottled up. And so without this ridge down into the southeast, it would be a lot weaker and that secondary shot could come down of some colder air that would give us four or five days of below average temperatures rather than just maybe one or two. So that ridge is going to try to build in on Wednesday to the south, bottling everything back up to the north and keeping average temperatures, if not slightly above average temperatures uh, in the forecast most of next week. Uh, so I'm not expecting a big swing in our temperatures, uh, well above average to well below average, rather right about average uh, for our Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. In terms of activity, uh, active weather, not a lot of dips in the jet stream either. In fact, we're starting to see the signs of uh, maybe another blocking pattern setting up back out here towards the west. Friday and Saturday of next week. Still a long ways away, but the next thing that we're going to be eyeing again, this is Monday and Tuesday, a week from now, this is the next pocket of cold air or energy in the jet stream uh, that could give uh, some active weather to the United States. Otherwise, pretty zonal, quiet. Uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. It's not until the weekend that starts to show up in some of the data. So what does that mean? Now, precipitation outlook dry uh, through a large portion of the United States. 
going to get to above average precipitation, possibly into Texas uh, and into Florida. What that translates to in regards to our temperatures, the 12th through the 16th, above average high temperatures on the other side of the system we're dealing with on the, on the, the weather map right now. Thanks, Matt. Well, as weather in South America is still moving the markets, plus a latest look at USDA's report just released Friday. We'll do that with John Cheeve and Mike North when we come back. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. John Sheeve joining us as well as Mike North. Had some reports out from USDA Friday. Typically not a big market mover. And John, it seems like USDA is in line with, with previous years. It really nothing major out of this report. Uh, that's right. I usually view this as probably the least important report of the 15 reports released during the year. Uh, we shouldn't expect anything. I think our focus is now solely on weather in South America for the bean crop, and that'll uh, be basically from December 20th through January 20th. That'll be the, the biggest time frame. Also, the exports will pick up for U.S. beans during that time frame, so we should see some, if we're going to see fireworks, it's going to happen during that time, and especially it depends what the weather is like for that. For the corn market, I don't see any reason to worry about uh, South American weather for corn until we get till April or May when their crop when that second crop goes into a reproductive stage and then maybe we can have a, a fireworks uh, for being or for corn. But at that time or until that time, I just look at a farmer wants to get five dollars for corn in the U.S. So that's going to be a trouble for them to sell it uh, or a, a point at which it gets sold. And then I think the end users want to buy 450. So we're probably stuck in a range somewhere around that 475, 480 mark up or down 20 cents from there. Do you agree with John? Was it justified to really not make any moves, major moves at this point? It's just too early. It is too early. And, uh, you know, when you look at this time of the year, we often don't make adjustments. Uh, the fact that they lowered uh, bean production by 2 million metric tons kind of falls in line with some of what I'll call boots on the ground analysis. Uh, some talking about uh, the you know, the early weather, maybe taking the cream off of the top, especially in northern Brazil. Um, but uh, it is really too early. We're, we're, as we saw with our own soybeans this year, uh, way too early in the game to be destroying yield uh, when we're just getting them in the ground. So, yeah, I, I would tend to agree with that. John, you mentioned that, you know, you think corn's going to just continue in this sideways trading pattern, but you look at the weather and kind of the talk about weather in South America and the impact it's had on the crop so far, not knowing what's yet to come. Do you think this could be, though, a bigger story in corn or soybeans? I think the weather first has to be a, a story for soybeans because that's the first one that's going to be affected. There could be a, a bit of an argument made that if the bean crop is delayed a little bit uh, from its plantings, that possibly that could push plantings back on the second corn crop, which would then end up in the May dry season and maybe hurt the yield a little bit. But since their yields are already only 80 bushels per acre across the country in general, I don't know that it's gonna be a substantial drop with the rain. And it's a massive area when you look at from the top of Mato Grosso to the uh, bottom of uh, Argentina's growing area in the Santa Fe region, you're talking about 2000 miles compared to Fargo, North Dakota to Jackson, Mississippi is only 1,200 miles. So, I mean, massively big area. It's spread out over a much bigger area, and the weather is way different across all of that area. Well, when you talk about it that way, it just, just allows us to see the scope of what we're talking about in South America right now. So, Mike, then moving forward, we mentioned it. Corn could continue to, to trade in this sideways pattern. I mean, at the end of the day, do you agree with that? Yeah, I think until we've got better knowledge of what the crop is, uh, we do uh, probably chop around here through the winter. Obviously, the January report and any adjustments they give us by way of yield in that could swing that out of the range. Um, and I would say, too, as we evaluate demand, uh, that will also uh, help swing conversation a little bit. But right now, both of those elements likely just keep it a little bit more sideways. John, do you think this is an opportunity to lock in feed prices or not yet? Locking in feed prices, I think I would buy on any of the dips. Uh, but from uh, from the sales side, I'm more concerned about a farmer who's unpriced. They need to be selling into any little rally they can, especially if they're far behind. Uh, but from feed price, I would stay in the spot market almost all the way through for the rest of the year. I wouldn't buy more than 30 days out. Mike, you agree with that? 
Absolutely. I'm a fan of calls on the feed side because uh, the bias is certainly lower here. You know, you go back and you look at stocks to use ratios at 15%. In prior years, that suggests a three and a half to four and a quarter price point. Here we are hanging out uh, at levels around $5. We need to be sellers of this. Well, USDA also making minor adjustments to U.S. ending stocks. Could more be on the way with these ramped up buys from China and places like Mexico? We'll discuss that later on U.S. Farm Report. Please stay with us. Tis the season for lemmings, and that's John's world this week. The holiday season lends itself to nostalgia and reflection on the past, and a long-standing memory and gripe jumped to my mind recently. The great lemming hoax. The image of hordes of these rodents spontaneously leaping into the ocean in mass suicide has become a familiar, even trite metaphor for group behavior. Like lemmings to the sea, we inject to explain illogical behavior, especially when it's linked to following a charismatic leader. The myth has inspired cartoonists for decades becoming so firmly lodged in our culture, no amount of fact checking is going to erase it. I was 10 years old when I saw this on Walt Disney's TV show during December. This scene in particular and the emotional jolt I felt has remained clear in my memory. To find out decades later, the producers created the event out of thin air, both triggered relief for my inner 10 year old and disgust. While well, Disney did not produce the show, they bought and aired it. To give you some idea of the fakery level, first, it's not filmed in the Arctic, it's Alberta. Second, the lemmings are the wrong species for the Arctic. The producers paid indigenous Albertan children to capture them. Three, it doesn't show the Ar Arctic Ocean, obviously, but a Canadian river. Four, there were only a few dozen lemmings at most, and five, if you watch closely, nothing jumps off a cliff like that. Seriously, backflips? These rodents were pushed, thrown, and spun off a turntable into the water. Now, setting aside the casual cruelty, the emergence of the lemming myth may have been the worst result of this deception. It has been used ever since to disparage followers blind to the ignorance and malice of their leaders. Maybe we just don't have any other widely known analogy to capture that concept. My guess is we're stuck with us, and those of us who point out it's totally fake are living in the wrong time and come across as pedantic bores. It seems people now often prefer fake to real so we can justify our beliefs and attack those who disagree with our fantasy world. When Daniel Patrick Moynihan said everyone was entitled to their own opinions but not their own facts, he was clearly working in the pre-internet world. Thanks, John. Well, when we come back, Machinery Pete takes us for a trip down memory lane with the McCormick Deary. Tractor Tales is next. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Tyrannus, moving the acre forward. Every acre tells a story. Find yours at acreforward.com. That's acreforward.com. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Lamar's Toy Store, the largest and most diversified farm toy store in the U.S. They have new and old, and do restorations and customizations too. You need to see it to believe it. Visit LamarToyStore.com or call us at 712-546-4305. Welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. This week, we're headed to central Oklahoma to check out McCormick Deering W30 that's still in its work clothes. Walter Wolfen owns this tractor. It's a... W30 36 model. These was used out in western Oklahoma and Kansas and all probably all up into Dakotas running one ways and, and drills and everything pushing for the wait for World War II when it came along and all and they was well used. We assume it's a local tractor. His nephew is a fireman and he's the one that found this tractor and uh, had it for years and sold it to a friend of his, that fireman that wanted to restore it, he restored it. So and that's probably been 10, maybe 12 years ago. Yeah. Fireman is a city boy and I think he was looking for maybe a father's son project, I'm not sure. 
but he took this on and this tractor was tore apart i mean complete yeah every gear out of it every bow the whole nine yards this thing was taken apart and uh he put it back it took him two years to put it back together but he got it back together and done a real nice job on it showed it one time and Walter wanted to buy it back because it was his nephews that had it and bought it back from him. But like I say, I'm just glad y'all are out here. I wish it was a prettier day, but it's Oklahoma. You've heard the term planting fence row to fence row, but is that smart? On South Dakota, researchers are working to make every acre count. Michelle Rook tells us how next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. Flip Your Soil on U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Smart Nutrition Map Plus MST. From the ground up, see this Smart Nutrition Map Plus MST sculpture come to life. Witness the power of your soil this season. Farmers looking for ways to flip their soil into something more productive may want to analyze the marginal acres in their operation. Michelle Rook looks at how South Dakota State University has partnered with farm and conservation groups to help farmers in the Northern Plains take those areas out of crop production. When grain markets are strong, there is more of a tendency for farmers to plant fence row to fence row. However, does this really pay? This is part of the precision economic analysis being conducted at South Dakota State University. High grain prices can incentivize producers to farm every acre in their operation to capitalize on those extra bushels. However, this can often put marginal acres into production. Over time, producers have done more to try to farm a few more acres or you know, they have the equipment, they can, they can put a few more acres into production that maybe was a field edge or um, had been more predominantly pasture or something else. Additionally, when farmers purchase or rent new land in the Northern Plains, they can also find out quickly that not every acre is suited for cropping or is profitable. Those uh, marginal lands are too dry, too wet, or too salty. We're finding a, a good ballpark number of about 10% of our farms are, are in this marginal state. SDSU Extension is helping farmers identify the areas that can end up costing them money through the Every Acre Counts program. Most farmers know there's a problem in the field, but what we use is a precision profitability analysis where we take in their precision ag data and, and combine it with their economics and, and do a profitability analysis across the field. That data is then mapped out and compared to normalized yields. And it's not about really knowing where the problem is, it's about where does that profitability line start and begin. Once that's identified, farmers can make informed management decisions for every acre of their operation. We provide them with how many bushels they'd have to increase in that area to break even, or how, how, how far they would have to reduce their expenses to break even. And, and a lot of the times it's, it's not going to happen. And, but Bly and Dearson say the Free Working Lands program also looks at factors that influence margins beyond just yield and market prices. What we've come across is areas where it's so frustrating or unprofitable year after year, or the, the, the salt levels or water levels have gotten so high that um, it doesn't make sense. In that event, he says it may be better for the farmer and the public to return the land to native grass and try farming it again in five to ten years. Plus, they help farmers decide what to do with lower wet spots in the middle of fields, plus salty or saline soils. A little bit in the short run with pulling it out, putting it into a perennial. Uh, the intermediate run is those marginal areas with a cover crop and then the whole farm profitability is a long-run goal. Addressing the worst areas, improving it all, should make the overall farm more profitable. And in the meantime, you get cleaner water, better wildlife habitat, and uh, it looks better going down the countryside. Um, so all those are positive benefits. Bly says reintroducing native cover can also improve soil health. If we think about those soils, the soil health there is, 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 is really poor. And, and so if we address those areas with another, another way of managing them, uh, perennials, uh, cover crops, whatever it would be, uh, we've automatically improved, 
improve soil health there. However, Bly says their long-term goal is to change the mindset of producers so they realize that not all soils are created equal and some acres are better suited for practices other than crops. I'm Michelle Rook for U.S. Farm Report. Thanks, Michelle. Well, when we come back, a deeper dive into demand as China ramps up its buys of U.S. corn and wheat. Our marketing discussion is next. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. We'll talk a lot about the minor adjustments in USDA's latest report to Brazil, looking at the scope of Brazil and Argentina's crop. But when you look at U.S. ending stocks, we did see U.S. or USDA trim corn ending stocks by 25 million bushels. We saw wheat the same. John, do you think that is because we have seen more buys come out of China and, and places like Mexico? We're definitely keeping the export pace up at what was matching what USDA has estimates out. My concern is, is that the national yield is going to grow. And then when we come in in that January report, the yield's actually a little bit bigger. And we're going to need all this export numbers to offset that number. So long term, I'm, I'm still very concerned about are we getting enough demand? And the fact that China has been buying at, uh, excuse me, Mexico has been buying at above normal pace uh, concerns me because I think that they're going to fall off in the spring. Ah, Mike, do you have that same sentiment? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, uh, you know, if, if we can walk uh, the uh, South American crop forward uh, without any real weather issues, they're going to have a lot to push into the world. And uh, frankly, they don't have the storage capacity uh, on pretty much any front. They're going to want to push as much as they can into the into the world market. And that really puts uh, our our export numbers in question. John, at this point, do we know why China is coming in and buying more U.S. wheat? I think it's just a function of that they've had some poor quality around the world. They're seeing an opportunity right here. They've seen some value on prices, and that's giving them a quick opportunity to add a little bit into their storage. Mike, do you think this has some longevity to it? Do you think this has some legs, or do you think this is short-term just filling some of those needs that they may have because of that short crop? Yeah, that, that, that short crop uh, has what's – it's definitely been what's inspired them to come to the market. But I think, you know, as you look at elsewhere in the world, uh, Australia has had some real issues with their wheat crop and downgraded a, a bunch of their soft red. Uh, we've got uh, certainly uh, available supplies and growing inventories here in the United States. And, you know, if I look to places like Argentina to try to fill in gaps, everybody's still scratching their head, waiting to see what the new president does with export tax. So, you know, a lot of people are kind of in a holding pattern. We're the best option out there. So if I'm China and I know I have a short crop, I'm going to try to get ahead of that. And U.S. is a great opportunity right now, especially with the U.S. dollar coming down, you know, three, three percent here over the last few weeks. John, you mentioned the January reports, and we know those are bigger reports and, and have more of an impact potentially on the markets. What do you think is worst case scenario and what do you think is best case scenario heading into January? Best case scenario is that they don't change the yield at all. I think the worst case scenario is that they add another two to three bushels per acre onto this based upon the producers I've talked to across the entire country. Everyone is absolutely surprised by their yields and most of them are all to the positive. I would say I had less than 10% of the clients that were telling me that the yields were worse than they expected. And that was only if they were in kind of a, a middle of Nebraska to Sioux City area. That was the only area that kind of saw some really bad potential outside of Northeast Iowa. Mike, are you concerned about global soybean demand though? I am. If you look at uh, USDA's reporting over the last few years, They've really been uh, overshooting what I'll call actuals, and um, that is the flip of the trend that we saw in all the years uh, preceding 2018. It used to be that you know they would raise their uh, expectations from the prior year by about 2%, and then we'd land at about 5% higher. We came into 2018, and they took the opposite approach. They started modeling growth at about a 5% rate, and by the time we'd get to the end of the year, we'd only grow about a point and a half to 2% over the prior year. So if you look at the current math against the balance sheet that we've been running on, there's room for uh, overall demand to drop by uh, as much as 20 million metric tons uh, based on what we're seeing right now. And in an, in an environment where the um, 
you know, the overall global economic situation is what I'll call soft or questionable, you really have to take a look at whether or not we're going to be able to hit their, their numbers. Mike North, John Chief, thank you so much for joining us this weekend. Up next, a one building town. We're off to Illinois with American Countryside next. American Countryside on U.S. Farm Report is sponsored by Nationwide and their farm certified agents. Founded by farmers nearly a century ago, Nationwide has the knowledge to help you succeed today and protect what's next for your farm or ranch at nationwide.com slash Andrew. Well, when you think of moonshine, you probably think of bootleggers. But for one Illinois town, moonshine has a much different meaning as we learn as we travel the countryside with Andrew McCray. It's just a crossroads in rural Illinois. You'll find the address these days listed as Martinsville, but this spot is a one-building town called Moonshine. Lisa Tuttle says there's a theory on the name. We don't really know, but the story is they seen a reflection from the moon on a puddle. There never was much here, except a store that served locals. The store was built in 1912. And it's always been like a general store. It was like a post office, um, grocery store. In the 1950s, Gladys Williams bought the Moonshine store and began serving lunches to local farmers and oil field workers. In 1982, Helen Tuttle, Jackie and Lisa's mother-in-law, purchased the store. The sign here says the population is just two for their in-laws who used to live above the store. In fact, the 12.30 closing time is all because their mother-in-law cared for her father-in-law. Helen decided she shut the grill down at 12.30 and she could be out the door by one to take him lunch and take care of Ed. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, after he passed care. away, she just never went back. And the grill shuts down at 12.30 each day, although they won't turn you away if you're standing in line. The place was popular and then reached national attention when CBS newsman Bill Geist came here in the early 2000s to do a story. Folks line up for a half-pound burger that is today served on a paper plate with all the fixings you want to load onto it. They've always called them the Moon Burger, and, it's, and people come in and think it's a specialty. I want but the it's Moon not. Burger. It's just it's, the name of our burgers. That's what people have kind of nicknamed our burgers. Yeah. It's just good ground beef, fresh, never frozen. On summer weekends, the line usually stretches out the door and down the road. We say six to 800 on an average. We might be, we've been over 800 this yeah. summer, but it usually averages between six and 800. While they do have to make money, they intentionally keep the prices as low as possible. The goal is to have a place that people of all ages can affordably come share a meal. There's little seating inside the store, so most enjoy the picnic tables outside under the trees. That leaves Lisa and Jackie to sometimes wonder why so many people travel so far to this out-of-the-way location just to eat a good burger. A recent experience perhaps shed light on what others see. I come up behind this lady, she's like at the top of the big hill and she's taking pictures across the field and I'm like slowing, I'm trying to figure out what she's taking pictures of. So I go around her and I get here while they pull in and I just said to her, I have to know, I said, what were you taking pictures of? And she's like, the landscape. And I'm like, I could not figure out what she was taking pictures of. And she's like, you have no idea. And I'm like, so do I take this for granted? And she said, yes, you do. <laughs> The population sign still may say two, but they can serve well over 200 people here in a day. People coming from far and wide to get their own moon burger from a store that's well over a century old. Traveling the countryside near Martinsville, Illinois, I'm Andrew McCray. Thanks, Andrew. You can watch or listen to more Andrew's travels on our Farm Journal YouTube page. Well, when we come back, growing organic. That's customer support this week. Well, what's the biggest hurdle in helping the production of organic produce, crops, and even livestock grow? That's customer support this week. A straightforward question today from Melody Kappenman from Leaf River, Illinois. How much is organic farming growing year to year? I'm hearing more and more about organic foods being available. Is organic farming anywhere near half of all farming in the United States and or the world? This is a great question, and the answer was mildly surprising to me. To begin with, data about organic products usually comes from producer organizations, and along with numbers from the USDA. While they do show historic sales growth, they almost never compare it to total retail food sales. To get the 
idea of share. For example, here's a chart showing organic sales since 2005 with steady growth. $60 billion is pretty impressive until you compare it with total food sales. Sales of food consumed at home were $1.05 trillion in 22, and food away from home $1.35 trillion. Organic numbers are production, USDA numbers are often consumption. Organic share of the food market is then anywhere from 25 to 6%, depending on how you measure. Global organic sales are roughly twice as large, uh, one, uh, 133 billion, but total global food sales are three times as large, so the organic share is less than 2% worldwide. Organic sales are growing, but have a long way to go to comprise half our consumption. Part of the problem with increasing organic sales is some food is really hard to produce organically. The biggest segment, produce, has been the most successful, but not all plants lend themselves to organic production. Organic dairy is challenging since the rules require organic feed, there are housing rules, ration and medicine restrictions, and more. Organic meat production has many of the same hurdles, but the largest, just organic feed components, are difficult to produce, particularly meeting the non-GMO standards for corn. Inflation has made consumers price sensitive and organic production requires higher prices to offset costs. The growth of the U.S. organic market has been met in part by imports, especially fruits. I doubt organic market share will increase much due to such production issues, but also because objective proof of organic advantages for consumers is still pretty sparse. Thanks, John. When we come back, at just 31 years old, one Virginia dairy farmer took over his family's operation, but that wasn't always the plan. We'll introduce you to the 2023 Milk Business Young Producer Award winner next. As we first shared with you last week, this year Farm Journal introduced the Milk Business Awards, one of those honoring a young producer 35 years of age or younger who not only excels in their operation, but is also a strong advocate for the dairy industry. This year's winner hasn't just broken the mold, he's created his own path for success, keeping his family's strong dairy legacy alive. On the edge of a bustling and bursting Washington, D.C., there's almost 40,000 cars a day go by the location, which is only two miles from the farm. You'll find a fourth generation dairy farm who ventured to this area in the 1970s to uncover a land of opportunity. I'm the second generation on this farm, but I'm the fourth generation of dairy farmers and Ben will be the fifth generation. Growing and evolving has become the way of life for Coolon LLC. Growing up, I always knew I wanted to farm and I always knew I wanted to be a dairy farmer. Ben interned at dairies across the country while in college, but after graduation, he decided to return home to continue the family's heritage. And I thought it was great for him to be able to come into a progressive herd, but to start on the ground with the grazing operation was a good experience, and it really brought him home to what he has become today, which is a successful dairy farmer. The farm's grazing dairy is where Ben got his feet wet right after college. It was a really good opportunity for me because I had, there I was alone. I had the opportunity to, to, to do well, to fail. The dairy is still a 100% registered Holstein herd today, milking 800 cows three times a day. We consolidated herds after we built a new freestall barn. And uh, now what was a grazing dairy is now our dry cow facility. We've grown on the register side to, to marketing genetics and, and selling registered bulls to either AI or other dairymen. We've grown in grain production. What started as a 200 acre farm now is a thousand acre contiguous block of land and we're crop farming 2,500 acres. The family continued to make improvements to the freestall barn, but the Smiths simply outgrew the space. The building was built in 1967, so it had served its purpose. And today we're milking in a uh, Bowmatic 50 stall rotary. And at just 31 years old, Ben purchased the operation from his parents. My gosh, he's done a lot in the first year. Uh, he expanded the heifer bar or the calf raising facility. Uh, you know, he's, he saved us money right off 
and started going to Balk Products and uh, he built a, a roof over the new Balk Products. Ben's keen sense of business quickly became a tool to the farm's progress. Our philosophy is if you're not growing, you're going backwards. So the plan is always to grow, but growth can be a lot of different things. And Ben's plans for the future of this family farm involve more growth and expansion. Ben may be focused on the future, but for this fifth generation farmer, he'll always cherish the past. I've been really, really proud. Um, if I talk too much about it, I will tear up. How proud I've become of a young man. In just a decade on the farm, Ben's journey has been one of dedication and innovation, which is what makes Ben Smith the 2023 Milk Business Conference Young Producer of the Year. Congratulations, Ben. Definitely very deserving of that award. Well, that does it for U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Thank you for watching. Be sure to tune in next weekend as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.